Thank you. Great to be here. All right, so uh, go, go ahead and pull the title up, if you would. Reconciliation is not an automatic follow-up to forgiveness. Jesus demands both. Reconciliation, it doesn't automatically happen when forgiveness does. You, you'd think, aren't those two like, if one happens, the other happens? And the answer is a big fat no. And I'm going to give you a couple examples, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm here for a reason. Um, we spent, so, so we go chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the Bible, and the last place that we landed was Exodus um, 37. Let me get there myself. And it was two weeks ago when I was, before I went on vacation. And so if you get to, oops, I said the wrong thing. Uh, let's move a little further. The Exodus 38. Exodus 38, starting at verse 1, and we did seven verses. This is as far as we got. Exodus 38, verses 1 through 7. That's why I said 37, the verse thing was in my head. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight a few things that I said before because I want to I retrace a few steps because I think it's super, super, super important to what God wants to say tonight. Just retrace a few steps of where I was a couple weeks ago and, and, and then lay the footwork for tonight. So I'm going to read it first. Anoint your word, Lord Jesus. Anoint your word. Every time we read it, every time we open it, you speak in the name of Christ. Amen. Exodus 38, 1 through 7 reads, They built an altar of burnt offering of acacia wood, three cubits high. It's about four and a half feet tall. It was square, five cubits long. That's about seven and a half feet long. And five cubits wide. So it's seven and a half feet wide. So it's a square. They made a horn at each of the four corners of this giant grill. And so that the horns of the altar were of one piece. And they overlaid the altar with bronze. They made all its utensils of bronze, its pots, shovels, sprinkling bowls, meat forks, and fire pans. They made a grating for the altar, a bronze network to be under its ledge halfway up the altar. They cast bronze rings to hold the poles for the four corners of the bronze grating so when they carried it, they didn't have to touch it. They weren't supposed to. They made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. They inserted the poles into the rings so that they would be on the sides of the altar for carrying it. They made it hollow out of boards. So we talked about a few things. One, that the, the, the tabernacle, this big uh, kind of rectangular tabernacle, is just a tent in the desert. And this is what God told Moses to build on top of the mountain. He spends 40 days listening to God, not even eating food or drinking water, just spending time in God's presence. That's his total sustenance. And he gets down. The people didn't know where he was. It looked like a volcano, so they build a golden calf, and they go just nuts. And he comes down. He's like, what is happening? God told him, go down. you got to talk to the people. They have already broken the one thing I gave them to do, which was not make another god other than me while they were waiting for you, and they did it. So go down, talk to him. So he goes down, talks to him, and he's like, I'm going to go back up the mountain. I'm going to get some instructions that God was starting to give me when you guys went, you know, crazy. So, so when I bring those back down, we're going to build a tabernacle. And here was the whole point. The people of God, all 2.5 million of them walking through a desert, just coming out of slavery, they, they just quickly falter. And, then, and, and, and this God is staying in their presence. And he tells Moses between the two 40-day intervals of staying on the mountain with him, he says, I can't go up with you. If I take another step with these people, I'm going to kill them. And Moses goes out and tells him that. He's going to, he's, he's considering what to do with you. And he said he can't go up with you or he might kill you. So strip all your ornaments and all the jewelry you're wearing and everything because this isn't about you right now. This is about you serving him. So, so take it all down and, and pray. And I'm going to go up and talk to him again. And this time, don't use all your jewelry to make another golden calf. So he goes up and speaks to God. And God says, now, it's so, so important. This is so important. I'm going to give you a picture of heaven, and that's what that tabernacle is going to look like. And when I do it, build it exactly the way I tell you to, exactly the way I give you. The instructions right down to the inches or the cubits. I want it exactly this way. It has to be because that's the way it'll look in heaven. 
And God was always foreshadowing to Christ, always foreshadowing to Christ. So they build the tabernacle, and he's given certain people the Spirit of God to build these crafts, and, and it's just seven pieces of furniture, and we got stuck on the first one. We didn't get any further than the first piece of furniture. In there are seven pieces of furniture, and thank you, and, and the first one is this big hibachi grill. And while it's the first thing that's there, it's also the ugliest. It's made of bronze. Everything else has got gold on it and is gorgeous and is pretty to look at. And, and this thing's just, it's overlaid with bronze. It's acacia wood overlaid with bronze. So we, so we mentioned several things. One, if you are a Hebrew and you want to get close to God, you want to interact with God, the first thing that you must do is, and the, only, is and, and the only thing that you can do really, is come into God's presence, which would be this tabernacle. Now you've got the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, whether it's day or night, always here. And then you've got, and that's God's presence, right? Like a tornado in, in your presence all the time that is showing that God's with you. But then backwards, you've got this hibachi grill going seven feet by seven feet with just smoke going up to heaven all the time and animals being burnt on it all the time. So there's that constant wonderful smell of barbecue all day long, every day, constantly going. And so it they, they draws them to the presence of God, and they understand that, okay, there's, whether there's a sin offering, a fellowship offering, a wave offering, whatever kind of offering, a burnt offering, whatever they're bringing to God, is coming out of their livestock. It's coming out of, what, of their own agriculture, and they bring it and say it's a sin offering. They put their hand on it, and they say certain things, and what, what it all has to do with, with them and the priest is you're transferring your sin, basically, to this substitute. There has to be a blood sacrifice for you, and then that's going to go into the fire instead of you. That's what's going to pay for the sin, not you. And they put their hand on it. They put their hand on their own livestock, which is going to be the substitute for them. Now, here's some, some things that we, that we went over. It's made of bronze. Bronze has incredibly low heat conductivity. That thing lasts for hundreds of years, and it's made of wood. It's a grill made of wood. You don't make grills out of wood. But this one doesn't burn up because of the bronze that it's encased in. And it has so low heat conductivity that it protects the wood. And it use, they have to keep it burning always. The fire is never supposed to go out. Never let the fire go out. So priests keep stoking that thing all the time. And still the wood doesn't get charred. The low heat conductivity of the bronze protects it. So first, it's representative of Christ in two ways. Bronze isn't that pretty. Jesus wasn't that pretty. Scripture tells, there was nothing, tells us there was nothing in him that made us look at him and go, wow, he's better than other people. It was how he behaved. It was how he acted. It's how, it wasn't how he looked. So you walk into the tabernacle of, in God's presence. The very first thing you see is this giant grill and all the smoke going up to heaven of all the sin of all the people, 24-7, always lit. And you go in and you see the bronze with this low heat conductivity. The fires of hell cannot penetrate Christ. To get to you. They can't. He has such low heat conductivity, it can't get through him to you. So he's both the altar and he's the sacrifice that goes on it, the substituting in your place, the blood that's shed in your place for your sin. He's all of that. Just like we look at the cross and we know Christ is represented by that cross. Nothing pretty, nothing, nothing awesome to look at. It's two pieces of wood. A kindergartner could take two popsicle sticks and make it. But it represents what was done for us. It represents the epicenter of all time where Christ came, got into our stormy boat, died for our sins, was substituted for us, and then became the bronze between us and all of the flames of hell that we were headed towards. You can have this perspective, we said, of, oh, the fire's always going, the fire's always going, the fire's always going because we're always sinning. We're such a tragic mess. Of course the fire's always going because we're always sinning. We always, always need forgiveness because we're always sinning. Yep, that's true. <laughs> that's true. But the perspective is not that. That's not the perspective that God was offering by putting this thing first. By the very first thing you see as you enter God's presence is this giant hibachi grill that burns off all our sin. The reason that that's going to be the first thing that you see is because, and we read it, 
It is a fire that is always available to any Hebrew who wants to atone for their sin. It's always available 24-7. If you've sinned, if you have done something wrong, you can go to God 24-7, 365 days a year, at any time, any given time, and that fire is lit and it will burn off the sin that you committed. It is there, it's available, and it burns off the sin. If you are willing to bring that to God and say, I've done this, I'm so sorry, I can't believe I've done this, it's always available. So yeah, the fire is always burning, but it's not a negative thing. It's an unbelievably positive thing. 2.5 million people all bringing their sin, bringing their sin, burning up, burning up, burning up. And then they do something else, and they bring something else, and they do something else, and they bring something else. And there's this line of people, and they're burning these offerings, and it's always available. It's not a God that's like, oh, enough of you people. In Leviticus chapter 6, verse 12 it is commanded that they always keep it burning. The priests have to gather wood and keep that thing burning. The whole purpose was make it always available. You're not going to show up at night and they're like, yeah, sorry you sinned. That's on you. The fire's out. There's nothing we can do about that. You can always be forgiven as long as the altar's burning. That's an awesome promise. It's always there. But there's also this, the very first thing, like, like if you're a Hebrew, you walk in, the only thing you get to come to is that one piece of furniture. You can see probably over, uh, out by the front door somewhere, you, about that kind of distance, you could see the, the, the washing basin that the priests use before they go into the most holy place, the holy place or the most holy place, but you're, not, you're never going to see that your whole life. If you're a Hebrew, you're going to get as far as the hibachi, the big grill. You're going to burn off your sacrifice. You're going to leave. That's your communication with God, but you keep atoning for your sin, and you keep that relationship between you and God strong and healthy, and you can feel it. It is a worship for them, and it's set up to be that. The priests, however, they wash, and they go into the holy place all the time, and one can go into the most holy place. The New Testament calls us a kingdom of priests. We can go into the most holy place whenever we want. We did it tonight. We're doing it right now. We can be in his presence at all times. We're called a kingdom of priests, those who are believers in Jesus Christ. But these guys would get it that far, and then they would ask for forgiveness, and they would touch that piece of their livestock, and they would identify with their sin, and they would identify that that was their Lord, and they would identify that this sin sacrifice was going to take away their sin so they could be in the presence of God and stay there. All this I say to just remind you of of kind of where we were, some of the main points. Please go back if you didn't see it, because I don't want to spend too much time on it and run through some of the things that went with that bronze grating uh, and and Nehushtan, the the bronze snake on the stick and how those things lined up. There's so much there. But I don't want to be there tonight. I want to go a little further in this same set of scriptures. These people are coming for forgiveness. They identify that they're sinners. They know that their relationship is destroyed with God right now, or it feels like it is. It feels like it's, it's interrupted. So they want to come fix that. And they bring, the altar, bring to the altar their sacrifice, and they leave feeling like, oh, wow, God and my relationship is restored. We are called to this, Christian. We're, it's, the biggest, it's one of the biggest parts of our faith is we're called to forgiveness. It's like the hardest thing. We're called to it. We're called to forgive like Christ forgives. We're called to it all through the scriptures. I'm just, just going to read a few for you. Just listen to some of these. Because <laughs> it's the, the, uh, the message is just so abundantly clear. Uh, One second, once I get rid of this ad. My phone is not being friendly to me tonight. Okay, there. Just want to read some of these to you. Ephesians 4.32, just listen, because you don't have to try to blow through all these. I want you to just hear them, because I'm going to move quickly. 
Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Forgive as Christ did. Mark eleven twenty five. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you, your trespasses. You forgive so you may be forgiven. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just give us sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Any sin, if we confess it, any sin can be forgiven. Matthew 18, 21 and 22. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I don't say to you seven times, but 77 times. Forgiving over and over like Christ does. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Ow! That's Jesus talking. Do you think he's putting a high priority on this? Luke 6.37, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. He's saying it again. Colossians 3.13, bearing with one another and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also, must also forgive. Even Jesus in the prayer Teach us how to pray, God. Teach us how to pray. And Jesus is talking to him how to pray. And he says, and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Because the people would come in and identify with their sin, they would restore the relationship with God. They identified with their sin. They knew it was, it was wrong what they did. They bring this sacrifice, which Jesus became for us. They identify with the sin. It's the very first thing you want to come into God's presence. The very first thing you've got to do is meet Jesus and have your sins forgiven by him. But you have to identify with them. You have to know, I need this, Jesus. I need this. You're my Lord, and I see that I haven't lived the way you want me to live. And I need this forgiveness and I'm sorry. And you identify with it and then you realize what he's done for you and there's this restored relationship. When you have a, an argument with a friend or a spouse or just you know, someone in your family and you both kind of go over the situation and what each of you, your part was in it or maybe it was just one of you who did something really kind of rotten to the other person. Usually we both have a hand in it. But sometimes it's just one. And they identify with it. I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have done that to you. And you're called to forgive that person. And what if they did it six times a day? Forgive them all six times if they keep coming back and they're sincere and they feel sincere to you. But what happens when the person is not repentant? What happens when because you know, when, when, when you have that disagreement and the other person comes, I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have done this, and, you're, and you forgive them, you're restored. Matter of fact, you're probably stronger than you were before because you have more, you're like, wow, that was really cool of you to come to me with that. I thought we were just kind of done after that. But we've talked it through and now, now we're kind of stronger. You, you have more faith that they would probably sit with you in this, in a problem and, and figure it out. That's why marriage becomes so powerful is because you, you live through a lot of life together and you have a lot of fights and you have a lot of arguments and you have a lot of things that you ask for forgiveness for, but you stay together and pretty soon you feel like, man, I don't know how to live without you because um, we work these things out and I don't, I don't want to start that process all over again with somebody else. I, I really, really trust you. Your, your relationship gets stronger. But if... Someone does something to you, and maybe repeatedly, and they are not repentant. And they, they haven't identified with their sin at all. They, they, matter of fact, they, their words to you might be, grow up, if you're hurt by it. Or it's an abusive parent. 
or it's just someone that just keeps hurting other people close to them, and they are not repentant. Are you still required to forgive? Absolutely you are. Because you're held captive as long as you won't. But is that relationship restored when you forgive them? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You don't suddenly, everything's not all better because you forgave the other person, even if you did it with your heart. I have people that had done things to me in my life that if I hear their name, it contorts my face. <laughs> You know, I, you can instantly know how I feel. I'm not very good at hiding it. And, and you know, I, I've had people in my life that if I hear other people talking about them and they're their friends still, but I'm not, uh, and I don't like what they did to me, it, it's hard for me not to say something. And, and I can feel something inside, a burn, something heavy. And when I forgive that person, regardless of how they acted, there's an unbelievable freedom in me that I can hear that name, I can be near that person, I can see them at Hannaford and be like, hey man, how you doing? And I know they're still going to be a jerk and it doesn't matter to me. Like that kind of thing is so freeing. But it hasn't fixed the relationship. It's fixed nothing except for what's inside of me. I don't have a better relationship with that person. Have you ever had someone do something that really hurt you and they were unwilling to apologize for it but they did come hug you and try to act like everything was okay and you know they're, they're going to hang out with you and still and stuff but they're not going to apologize for that and if you bring it up it's like no no they're not going to go there and then they're going to do something else later on you know it because that's kind of their trend you can still kind of be together i've got a lot of people like that in my life you probably do too where it's like, there's not going to be an apology. There's not going to be a, rep a reparation. What's going to happen is you're going to forgive them and you'll need to do it again and again and again. But they'll come back and act like nothing's wrong and you can hang out. Like there's other parts to that person's personality that you like. So you'll do stuff together. You just know we were like real tight. We, were, we had this great relationship, but now we can only go this far. Do you know what I mean? Like maybe they're a real bad gossip. And you've said stuff and, they, and it really burned you because you thought it was just the two of you talking. You may be venting a little bit and they went right to that person. So now you know, okay, we can only go this far. I'm not going to let you too far into my life because you'll hurt me with it. Or maybe it's, you know, sometimes they're an awesome friend, but sometimes you'll be several friends together and they only want to hang out with these and they don't want to hang out with you anymore because they like them more. But, you know, you're okay if there's no one else around, you know, that, that kind of thing. And, and, you know, you know they're going to do it every time. But yet, when you hang out, it's really fun. You're just like, okay, I know we're only this close. But that's as close you're going to get. But if you really want the relationship restored, you've got to identify with the sin. Let me give you an example from Scripture, because I think it's just a wicked, interesting section of Scripture, and it really matters. This matters. I'm, I'm saying this all for a reason. I know God's saying it for a reason tonight for us, and why I didn't move on from here. I know he's got something for us. And where, where I'm going is Genesis 33. I'm going backwards in the word for something that we're seeing right now. So Genesis 33, what you've got happening is Esau is coming back to visit his brother, Jacob. Last time they were near each other, Esau was going to kill him. And he said so. He said, I'm going to kill my brother because he stole my blessing. I hate his guts. I'm going to kill him. And Jacob runs away and he spends like decades somewhere else, has two wives and a bunch of kids, and he's coming back, and he meets his brother. His brother's coming out to meet him with 400 men. Last thing he heard was a, th a death threat, and now his brother's coming with 400 men, and he thinks, well, he's coming to kill me. So he puts his least favorite wife and kids out front <laughs> and his most favorite wife and kid in the back, figuring that maybe they can get away, and he just keeps coming forward with all these gifts for his brother to appease him before they meet. 
So I'm going to read this little section. Jacob looked up, and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children uh, among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. And he put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next. I said Leah, Leah, and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. And he himself went on ahead, and he bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around him, around his neck, and he kissed him, and they wept. And Esau looked up, and he saw women and children. Who are these with you, he asked. Jacob answered, they're the children that God has graciously given your servant. And then the female servants and the children approached and bowed down, realizing they're not going to die now. And next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all came Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. At least Jacob went first. Esau asked, what's the meaning of all these flocks and herds that you sent ahead of you that I met? I ought to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, he said. But Esau said, ah, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob. If I found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God now that you've received me favorably. Please accept the present that was brought for you. So, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted the gift. And then Esau said, well, let's be on our way. I'll accompany you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are tender and that I must care for the ewes and the cows, uh, the ewes and the cows that are nursing their young. If they're driven hard for just one day, all the animals will die. So let my Lord go on ahead of his servant while I move along slowly at the pace of the flocks and herds before me and the pace of the children until I come to my Lord and see her. Esau said, well, then let me leave some of my men with you. But why do that? Jacob asked. Just let me find favor in the eyes of my Lord. So that day Esau started on his way back to Seir. Jacob, however, went to Succoth in a completely different direction where he built a place for himself and made shelters for his livestock. He goes somewhere else. They have this weeping reunion, family reunion. They hug each other's neck. They cry. Oh, what's all? Is this all your family? Yeah, yeah. You got lots of stuff? Yeah, yeah. Me too. Come on. Let's go home. Okay. You just go ahead. I'll be right there. He's not going. He won't go. He doesn't trust his brother. He bows down, he bows down, he's, he's, he's apologetic, you know he kind of stole his, his, his the, he kind of rooked, rooked him out of his uh, inheritance, but not really. But Esau's not making any amends. Esau's, Esau was ticked because he's like, you're going to get all the good stuff and I'm not getting anything. He cries to his father, bless me too, father, me too. He's a grown man, me too. And then he does get blessed. God's amazing. He blesses him anyway. He's got all of these things. He says, I don't even need your gifts. I got all kinds of stuff. I'm good now. But he never says to him, I I'm sorry that you had to leave home and stay away. And, uh, you know, it's been decades and I never wrote <laughs> and said, hey, I'm not going to kill you, by the way. <laughs> I I'm over it. I got all kinds of stuff now. If you get there and there's that moment of, oh, wow, we're cool again, are you? Because he went a different way. Because he doesn't trust him. They're not cool. They're cool enough. There's enough. Okay, we can interact. If I see you at Hannaford, oh, yeah, you get some livestock in Hannaford. Yeah, me too. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Hug each other. That's cool. But they're not who they used to be. They're not brothers that grew up to each other, with each other playing tag and hunting stuff together. They're not where they used to be. Jacob didn't apologize for stealing the blessing, which he knew Esau was ticked about. Esau did not apologize for tr attempting to kill him, for saying he would and holding up his end of the bargain. Like if Jacob came home, he was a dead man. It's decades later. There's been no communication. No one tried to fix this. And they hug each other, so they're on safe ground. But the relationship is only this strong now, not this strong. It's only that strong. It's going to stay right there 
until one of them, or both of them really, identify with the sin or the relationship will not be reconciled. It stays weak. And Jacob goes one way and Esau goes another. This is so crucial to the body of Christ. It's so crucial. There are a lot of people in the body of Christ that you, know, you have disagreements at different times. And, and, and you see each other a while later. You don't really talk about the problem. You just say, hey, hey, and it's kind of like everything's good now, but it's not good. It's just good enough to see each other. But it's not good. You haven't fixed it. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes the other person's going to remain unwilling and there's nothing you can do. So you leave that with the Lord. But it is our job to identify with our sin and then own it enough to aim for reconciliation. It's, it's, uh, it's on us to aim for reconciliation. Aim, it's, it's on us to even own any part of it that you can to give the other person some ground so that they might be willing to come and speak to you. It's on us to do that. Not to fake it. I mean, you, have to, you might have to fake it to a degree, but not to own stuff that's not true. But just to look at it and ask God, well, what did I do to get them so upset? Is there something I've done? And there might be nothing. But if there is, it's on us to at least own that much. And talk to the other person and say, look, I'm sorry I did this. I think maybe that might have hurt you. That might be where you are, why you are where you are. Why you said, no, I just don't like you. Oh, okay, well, I forgive you. We're done. <laughs> you know? See you at Hannaford. <laughs> you know? There's nothing you can do with that. You, you have to leave that with God. But it's on us to attempt to reconcile, not just forgive. And, and, it's, and that never goes away. That never, as long as you're breathing, that never goes away. If that relationship, if God gives an opportunity for that relationship to actually reconcile, not just be okay with the other person, reconcile, where you could be stronger than you were, whew, he will bless it if we'll move in it. And he won't if we don't. He'll make you aware. And then we have a decision to make. Right before I went to Florida, I don't think I mentioned this. Maybe I did. Maybe I did. I think maybe I did. I don't know. But I was at a pastoral meeting, and another pastor said something about someone I really care about and didn't know I knew them. But it was derogatory and very, very offensive to me. And I was grabbing my chair to keep from grabbing his chair. Yeah. Uh, it was really ripping mad. It was someone I care deeply about and someone that has recently passed away that I love. And he was saying something that was not kind. And it was something from their own past. And when it was done, I was fuming. And I left that meeting with everyone knowing that I was. I didn't say much. But that's enough for, to let people know that I am mad. <laughs> you know, for me not to talk. And, and he, he asked me, oh, do you know what I'm talking about? I said, yes, I do. And he saw my face. He said, well, you want to hear my side? I said, no, I don't. And I walked out of the meeting. I was not happy. I texted him or I emailed him afterwards, and I explained why and why that hurt me so badly. And I, di I did it pretty cleanly, the way God would have me do it. I didn't do it the way I wanted to do it, but I did do it the way God wanted me to do it. And I came in the next day to that man here, coming from another place that I was ministering to someone, and I came here, and he was here waiting for me with tears in his eyes and apologizing. I have to tell you that that man has a lot of relational currency with me now. A man that I considered a friend, but we didn't know each other much deeper than that. Now he's someone I trust because he saw that he hurt me and he responded and he apologized. And he's like, I'm so sorry. My, re my, re my 
interaction with this person was way different than yours. I, but, I, but I see that. And I, I hear you. And I'm, I'm just so sorry. I just, I can't leave here until I know we're okay. Me and this other pastor are completely reconciled. And we're actually way stronger than we were in a friendship because I saw he was willing to do that. See, it's dangerous ground. He could have come here and that could have gone badly. <laughs> you know, it's scary ground to do that. But it's high risk, high reward. It's a much bigger risk to ignore it if God puts it on your heart. When he says, forgive as Christ forgives, Christ has an altar, a huge hibachi that's always open. And just in this room, the sins that we could burn on that altar, that could keep going up and up and up and up. But America has a much bigger hibachi with a much bigger pillar of smoke. And this Jesus just keeps forgiving and the altar's always open. It's always open. But if you don't identify with your sin when you come to Christ, and you just want what he has, but you don't want to identify with your sin, then you can't meet God. Jesus says, there's no way to the Father except through me. There's no way except through me. You must go to the brazen altar first if you want to go to the most holy place. You must go there first. You identify with your sin. You own it. You, you confess it. You say you're sorry for it. And the Lord, who has a burning altar that's always open, forgives it. And the relationship is restored and reconciled. Always. It's restored. What if I did the same thing like 25 times? Then on the 26th time, it's restored. Identify with it. Put it on the altar. Give it to him. Ask for strength not to do it anymore. He's your Lord, not just your Savior. He's both. But you can't get to God without reconciling. You want, you want that relationship restored? Confess the sin. John 1.9 didn't just say, 1 John 1 9 doesn't just say God is faithful to free you from all sin, to forgive all sin. It doesn't just say that. It says confess your sin and he will forgive you for all and any sin. You've got to reconcile the relationship. That's what this whole thing was about, people. That's what the whole tabernacle was about. It was a big, fat arrow in the sand pointing to what Christ was going to do. It's what it was, the whole thing. And do you think him dying on the cross was just forgiving our sin? No, it was about giving us eternal life, about giving us the Holy Spirit, about training us to reign with him forever. There's so much more. It was the epicenter of all time. We want to reconcile the relationship. And every time we sin, we interrupt the flow of that. And so we go back to him and say, Lord, I lay this on the altar. And he forgives because that altar is always open. We need to do that with people. We need to do it with people. You can forgive. And if someone is unwilling on their end to receive it, if someone's unwilling to own their piece of it, that's not on you. But it might be on you to see your peace in it. It might be on you to recognize what did I do to help facilitate where we are right now. <laughs> I might have an end to this. I might have something that if I offered just this much, they might be able to get that much closer to me. Because everybody hates it being all on them, right? <laughs> Give someone something. <laughs> You know, and you might be able to start restoring pieces of it. Look, yeah, I know I, I, you really acted like a jerk. I think I did this that might have started that. If someone, yeah, yeah, you did. Well, let them have that. <laughs> you know, it might, it might restore it if they're willing to own what they did. But if they don't, you, if you forgive, you're free of that hatred. But it's not like you've gained your brother back. 
not till they identify it. Reconciliation comes when both sides are willing to see what they did. And then the relationship's stronger than when you started. I don't know why that felt so important to get that out tonight, but I felt like the Lord was saying, this is where I want to go. I don't want to move on to the, I was going to walk right through week by week the different parts of the tabernacle, which I'm going to do once we get past the brazen altar. But the brazen altar is a pretty big deal. So if you want to get past the brazen altar, you've got to be able to forgive like Jesus. You want to be free? Forgive like Jesus. You want to be able to forgive like Jesus? Then go to the altar yourself and ask, fill me with your Holy Spirit in such a way that I start behaving like you do. So I start thinking like you do. Because you're not just my Savior, you're my Lord. I want to be what you are. And the more we behold him, the more we become like him. You know when it gets harder to forget to forgive? When we spend less time with him. Because then you spend more time with what you hate about that person. If you spend less time with Christ, you spend more time with the world. One last thing about the brazen altar. I mentioned it last time. It's so vital. And this, is why I was, this is why I felt personally like I had to take something to the altar with, with the Lord. I, I, tru- I truly, I just honestly say, as the leader, as a pastor and a leader of my family, I should have been initiating more Let's, 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 let's fellowship more together in a spiritual, like, like stop everything and let's, let's put God first. Should have initiated because all my children love to. They, would, they will initiate it. But we just all were, you've got one with a brand new, you've got two with brand new babies. All three of them almost lost their homes. Two of them almost lost their job because of that storm, the, the, the hurricanes in St. Pete. And it was so brutal. Everybody was just so bedraggled. But that's when you, that, I know this, I know this. That's when you lean in harder. We could have accessed that more and found a lot more peace walking out the other side of it. Just because, just because we need it. Because he's in the boat. Because he's in the boat and he can put a hand up and stop the storm. And we had an amazing time. I'm not, I'm not even going to say we did not. I'm only saying I felt guilty like I should have initiated that more. And now what you do is you initiate it more. <laughs> you don't think, right, it's okay, no way to fix it. Oh, well, let's move on. You, okay, in my world right now, every chance I get, more fellowship. So that brazen altar, what did they do every day? They gave fellowship offerings every single day, morning and night. Fellowship offerings. We got to do the same thing. All I did was get home and crack open the Bible and say, let me just read a psalm with you guys tonight. I have been horribly neglectful about being a father in the kingdom and being a pastor and not making sure that we at least read a word together. You know, we say, say a prayer here, a prayer there. We, we, we all, we're all Christian families. I mean, that, he's, our, he's in our conversation all the time, but there's something about purposefully focusing. Do you understand the difference? about it just being something that you kind of do because you're a Christian and stopping everything, purposely focusing. We should do that morning and night. That's what they did with the brazen altar. A purposeful focus towards God. It doesn't have to be super long, but it should be super involved. You should be, you should be involved. Open his word. Don't let it sit there unopened. I, just cra- I think Psalm 16 is a good one. It was, but it wouldn't have mattered what I picked. It would have mattered that I tried. So what happens when you start slipping? Stop slipping. Start right now and jump back in the game and offer fellowship offerings and don't let it slide. Because he's in the boat. And he can stop storms. We'll just pray ourselves out tonight because I think about 7.30. Yeah. Lord Jesus... I feel so strongly like you vitally wanted that to get across tonight, like you 
you know that we have people here tonight, including myself, that just really, really needed to re-engage in a new and aggressive manner to just to fellowship with you on a deeper level and make a point of it with other Christians, not just even just on our own, with other Christians. It is so important. And as families, it's easy to pull off. If you have a family that wants to, as a church family, it's easy to pull off. We just have to want to. I pray, Jesus, we give ourselves more and more and more over to you, and we burn fellowship offerings daily so that we can, so that we can stay so close to the pillar of fire, so we can stay so close to the Savior who can calm the storms in our life. They're only moments, but they're heavy when they hit. We love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you. We know that you're the Lord of our lives, and we ask for you to move in power. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have an awesome night, everybody.